perspectives about decriminalization of drugs in Canada. And we'll hear about some decriminalization efforts now underway in the country. And we're gonna take a look at in the US are allowing greater access to psychedelics. We do encourage donations if you're in a position to give and your support goes a long way in helping us work towards making psychedelics accessible and safe. Uh, MAPS Canada is a nonprofit charity that relies entirely on public donations to help us achieve our mission, expanding safe access of psychedelic medicines for all Canadians. To learn more about MAPS Canada, you can visit our website at mapscanada.org. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going. If you're new crowd, to Crowdcast, there are a few things to note. On the right side is the general ch chat where you can have conversations with other audience members. Below there is a ask a question panel. And uh, episodes of this series will be recorded and available to watch again right here in Crowdcast. So if you do miss an episode in our four part series, you can still follow the invite link and view the replay. In order so that everyone can get the most out of this webinar, we're going to ensure that chat remains respectful and we're going to answer questions that are relevant to the topic of decriminalization. So, awesome. So we've got uh, some amazing guests for you tonight. And again, the topic is decriminalization. And just a little bit of background. The criminalization of drug use in Canada is, is a fairly recent uh, endeavor. Laws prohibiting the use and possession of cannabis, heroin, cocaine, and other drugs were passed in the early 1900s. These laws were often based on moral judgments and racist ideas about specific groups of people and the drugs they were using. For example, uh, laws targeted Asian immigrants who consumed smokable opium. Decisions about the legal status of drugs, including alcohol, uh, were not and are still not generally based on scientific assessments of their potential for harm. There's often no relation between how we regulate things or control them and the actual harm of the substance that is objectively observed. The so-called war on drugs, which began in the 1970s, has not reduced the supply or the demand for drugs. Despite the trillions of government dollars spent enforcing drug prohibition around the world, uh, the illegal drug market continues to grow and is estimated at between uh, 425 and 650 billion dollars US per year. Uh, people continue to want to use drugs whether they're legal or not. The war on drugs has cost vast amount of public funds, imprisoned millions, and increased violence across the globe. It's led to a toxic and deadly illegal drug supply that has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Canadians. Despite this war, drugs are more available and used than ever. And we, collect, and we are collectively understanding the futility of past approaches. Calls for decriminalization have increased in Canada and around the world. Criminalization has resulted in negative beliefs and stereotypes about people, resulted in them receiving criminal records that make it hard to find jobs, place to live, difficult to access harm reduction services that reduce the risk of injury, disease, and other harms, and have forced people into unsafe spaces, high-risk behaviors, um, and has led to increase in overdose, transmission of HIV and hepatitis C um, due to needle sharing, and created an illegal drug market that produces stronger drugs for higher profits, resulting in poisonings, overdoses, other harms. And on top of that, it costs Canadians about $2 billion a year for police, courts, and prisons to enforce our drug laws. So when we start talking about decriminalization, what, what is it? So Decriminalization refers to laws, policies, or practices that eliminate criminal penalties for activities related to drugs. Currently in Canada, possession, distribution, and production of drugs without authorization are all criminal offenses. Most often, decriminalization means removing or reducing penalties for possession of drugs for personal use, while distribution and production remains illegal. To date, no jurisdiction in Canada has actually, in fact, decriminalize drugs. Um, key point about decriminalization is that a vast majority of substance use does not harm the individual or anyone else. In a small percentage of cases, people can develop problematic use, which is defined as experiencing ne negative consequences from their substance use, or they might become physically or psychologically dependent on drugs. And of course, the reasons people develop substance use issues are complex,
and it can include genetic, biological, and social factors, including experiences of trauma. Decriminalization in some form or another has uh, been implemented in dozens of jurisdictions around the world and has uh, led to better health, public health outcomes overall in those places. It's now supported by many organizations, jurisdictions in Canada, including the Canadian Public Health Association, province of British Columbia, cities of Toronto and Vancouver. It's also supported by multiple agencies in the United Nations system. So I'd like to introduce our first guest tonight, um, who is going to discuss further the impacts of criminalization. And that is uh, Akwasi Owusu Bempa. He's an academic author and change maker. He's a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Toronto and an affiliate scientist at Canada's Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Akwasi's academic work has examined the racialized nature of drug law enforcement in North America. He's the co-author of Waiting to Inhale, Race, Cannabis, and the End of Prohibition to be published by MIT Press. So welcome, welcome Akwasi. Thanks. Good evening, Scott. Good to see you. Likewise. Likewise. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so um, Akwasi, who, who, gets, who gets charged? Who gets caught up in the net of arrests in Canada, typically? I, I think, I, I think it's, it's certainly not a thing that anyone listening and tuning in from the United States. Um, we've had less access to, you know, data that would tell us who um, gets charged, especially with respect to race in the Canadian context up until recently. But I think you kind of foreshadowed it with uh, some of your opening discussions. So I'll, I'll plug a, a recent piece of work that I was involved in with uh, Vice Canada, Rachel Brown, who had uh, managed to get through freedom of information request racially desegregated data on cannabis arrests from across the country, which unsurprisingly showed that black and indigenous people in the country were more likely to be uh, arrested and charged with minor cannabis possession. Just yesterday, actually, released similar data um, on uh, drug arrests minus cannabis. And so uh, Ottawa, Toronto, Regina, Saskatoon, Vancouver, all included in this work. And uh, surprise, surprise, black and indigenous peoples across those jurisdictions uh, we're more likely to be charged with drug possession. So I think it's, you know, well known that people that are, are, are uh, you know, marginalized in our society, economically marginalized, uh, racially marginalized, sexually marginalized, uh, are certainly more likely to be targeted by the police for drug-related offenses as they are a host of other offenses. And, and we see that come through. And I want to go back to, you know, kind of where you started. You know, one of the first things that you said, and I think this is really important for us to continue to consider, is that, you know, criminalization is the anomaly when we think about like drugs historically, right? Like for most of human history, drugs have been legal. And, and when we look across jurisdictions, Canada, the United States and elsewhere, it was, you know, really fears about the other and fears about the racialized other. As you said, you know, uh, Asian, largely Chinese immigrants on the West Coast of Canada, um, prompting the, the Opium Act of 1908. But even before that, you know, uh, it was actually our indigenous populations that were first targeted by drug prohibition in the context of alcohol. Uh, alcohol prohibition first only um, was only you know targeted or directed at indigenous populations. The writings of Emily Murphy um, helped bring about uh, many would argue cannabis prohibition, and 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 um, she connected you know fears of racialized migrants and black people in particular. So I've said a lot. Um, in, in that short amount of time. But again, in a nutshell, it, it is largely our Black and Indigenous populations in, in the context of the work that I do, because I'm a, a, a scholar who studies race in the justice system. But again, people who are living on the margins of our society more generally are more like, more like targeted. targeted. Yeah. So, so just for clarity, it's, it's not as if Black or Indigenous people, are, are they using drugs more than uh, non-Black or white people? Or is there something else going on that's that's getting them arrested more frequently? So where the story gets a little bit more complex, and in the Canadian context, it's harder for us to tell the story with good empirical data, but we can look to other places. So to, to answer the first part of your question, um, no, it, it doesn't seem from the limited data available that Black and Indigenous people are, are significantly more likely or even more likely to use drugs than are, for example, white people. And, and in some cases with certain substances, they're less likely to consume drugs. We do need to consider the circumstances that, you know, again, Black and Indigenous people in particular are, are more likely to live. Um, those are, are oftentimes neighborhoods or areas that have a higher concentration of police generally. 
uh, more likely to live in impoverished areas, uh, higher crime neighborhoods, places with high police presence. When, when I think about it, I do a lot of work looking at, at, at black populations in Canada, especially at urban centers, they're more likely to live in densely populated neighborhoods, um, uh, live in apartments, uh, sometimes multi-generational uh, family mm -hmm. homes. And so what I'm getting at here is they don't necessarily have the benefit of large amounts of private space, whether that be a house to themselves or a, a house with a backyard that they can use drugs without you know, putting themselves at, at risk of coming uh, to the attention of the police. And the same goes for other kind of drug related activities, even the sale of drugs. Like I, I often joke, we're both in Toronto right now, like pre pandemic, and I'm sure now you could go down to King Street you could walk into any one of the bars, restaurants, nightclubs along King Street at one, two o'clock in the morning, and you'd see a lineup of, of people waiting to go into the stalls to use the toilets. And not the urinals, when I'm talking about the the, the, the guys' washrooms. And it, you know, it was always peculiar to me. Like, are these people all waiting till they get to the club to you know go to the bathroom? Like, no, they're not. They're going to use drugs, right? But the cops aren't going there, and they're, they're not necessarily kind of... Um, patrolling or, or, or trolling through those those uh, spaces to find people who are using drugs, right? They focus their efforts elsewhere. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the arguments uh, for decriminalization is, is around the stigma. And I think, you know, I think nobody, nobody would prefer to go and inject drugs in a dirty ba bar bathroom um, uh, alone. And I think you know when, when they when they undertake that activity, a lot of the times it's it's staying out of the eyes of the police. You know, and I know, I know in Vancouver, uh, where I'm from, you know, we would have, um, you know, there's still people who sort of evade the police and they'll go behind a dumpster and do something, and those create a lot of risks. If you overdose, there's nobody seeing you uh, to respond or things like that. So it's, it definitely creates a climate um, that you know that that decriminalization would address that. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I think ultimately, ultimately. We, we've talked about this a little bit before. For me, decriminalization really should just be a stepping stone because I think it's more politically and socially tenable towards like legalization and regulation, right? Like as a criminologist for a whole host of reasons, decriminalization doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense. Like you're sending mixed messages to society generally, like we don't want you doing this, but we're not getting you in trouble. You can do this, but only to a certain extent, you know, thinking about possession limits. Um, you can do this, but you can't actually have access to the substance that you need, right? So like, I, I certainly uh, recognize that, you know, talk about the Canadian context, many Canadians wouldn't get behind, many politicians wouldn't get behind today, full legalization and regula regulation of all drugs, right? So uh, for me, decriminalization, um, given the way that the conversation is going now, and, you know, obviously you talked already about the uh, applications uh, to decriminalize for exemptions um, in jurisdictions that are uh, have either already been submitted or, or are being discussed that, that this is somewhere that we may be able to get uh, in the not too distant future. I think it's wise to go this direction, but I want to see us go much further. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and uh, you did a good segue. I can, I can plug uh, the fourth episode in uh, this series, which is about legal regulation of drugs. And I I agree, and I talk about I, I talk about regulation as being sort of this like way out of the war on drugs. Um, it, it's a way we can take back control. So uh, that'll be in we do the months uh, July. We'll, we'll have uh, some folks talking about what legal regulation would be. Um, yeah, and, and I agree. Like decriminalization, is sort of a, a palatable or, or semi palatable stepping stone where the public can get beyond uh, the idea of you know. Uh, you know, we, we, it's wrong to criminalize people for uh, cr criminalize people for uh, using substances or possessing them. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah so uh, I, I guess I, I'd like to uh, bring bring on our next uh, speaker to join the conversation, um, and that's Michelle Scott, who's uh, one of our own. She's a volunteer at Maps Canada, and uh, Michelle is a uh, occupational therapist. She works in mental health in Toronto. She also leads the Toronto-based policy and advocacy group for us, MAPS Canada. Her goal is to expand access to above-ground psychedelic medicines in a way that's ethical, sustainable, and responsible. Welcome, Michelle. Hello. There you are. Hi. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's uh, it is, it no, is surprise no surprise that the, the 
oops, I'm hearing myself echo. Oh, there we go. Um, um, that the that, data that's... about uh, BIPOC individuals being uh, overrepresented among uh, among our drug arrests, um, it's just, it's not a surprise. And it's so cool to be here with you across the contributing to that awesome research. Um, yeah, so I've been um, volunteering with MAPS uh, Canada since a uh, bunch of us got together in a room and we're like, we should start a Toronto chapter. Um, and we've uh, uh, gotten uh, across the involved in a number of our meetings. So it's it's awesome to, to have you here talk about this important topic. Important topic. Um, so we're talking um, about how so legislation, about how legislation is, is a way out way. of um, the war on drugs potentially. Is that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Scott. Is that what you were saying? Well, I'm, I'm, I was hoping you could feel like, like right now there's, uh, you know, there's four different bills in some stage and, um, people are going for Section 56 exemptions and other things. I'm wondering if you could just give us a bit of overview of what where things are at, and maybe uh, I, I know I know uh, you put together you and uh, colleague Taylor put together a helpful chart uh, compare and contrast the different bills, and uh, I'm sort of just you know interested in like what's out there and your take on on them. Like which one which ones what are the kinds of things we should be supporting uh, from the bills or a big picture what what would be what we, um, you know, the, what we want to see happen and what do we think is going to happen. Cool. cool. Um, um, so, yeah, yeah, I have I to, have to uh, give, uh, big give props big props to Taylor and the rest of the um, uh, MAPS Canada policy and advocacy team um, who, uh, Taylor basically put together that chart. I did not put together that chart. Uh, so big, huge uh, props to him and, and the rest of the team for, for putting together the work on this. Um, but before we even talk about um, you know, Section 56 requests, the bills that are currently now in Parliament, even the SAP. Um, we, it's, it's a good idea to almost take a step back and take a look at um, the legislation that currently exists. Uh, because right now, um, other, so it's almost like there's two different avenues towards legal access to psychedelics. One is like, how do we use loopholes or um, I don't know if loophole is the right word. How do we use embedded uh, ways of getting at uh, legal psychedelic medicine to circumvent the current legislation? And then there's the other way of like, how do we propose new legislation? So the, the and the legislation in, in particular, and this isn't actually something, I'm not a policy analyst or anything, um, this isn't something that I was even aware of um, prior to joining uh, MAPS uh, Canada and, and, and learning about uh, who actually makes these laws, what are the um, what are the pieces of legislation that govern this. So um, there's the Food and Drugs Act or the FDA, there's the American FDA and then there's the Canadian FDA. Same acronym, same words, it's a little bit confusing, but we have our own FDA. And that's sort of how uh, drugs become legalized. So anything to do with um, consumable foods, anything to do with uh, legal drugs, uh, pharmaceuticals, has to be included in um, and and uh, is under the jurisdiction of, of the FDA. And then illegal drugs or controlled drugs or substances is under the jurisdiction, jurisdiction of another piece of legislation called the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act or the CDSA. And this is where the schedules come into play. And, um, you know, like you you hear about uh, different drugs being scheduled uh, or different substances being scheduled at different levels, which determines the level of sanctions that exist. So um, when we're talking about um, the embedded opportunities to circumvent the legislation that actually exists inside the legislation itself, um, that's where sort of like, <coughs> excuse me, your SAP, your Section 56 exemptions come in. So I'm just recovering from COVID. So I've like got a tickle in my throat. Give me one second. <coughs> so while you're, while you're doing that, so, so you're, you're talking uh, a Section 56 exemption, uh, just to unpack that for some, some folks who might, might not be uh, familiar with that. That's uh, Section 56.1 or sub one of the Controlled Drugs and Substance Act, which lets the health minister exempt anything, right? And so so right now, what are who, who's asked for these exemptions so far? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, one of the ways that you can get, like it's literally an exemption to the legislation. So it's like, 
CDSA, you're able to, um, you know, that, that's the legislation that criminalizes drugs, that imposes sanctions on people for using substances. But you can get an exemption from that if you apply for a Section 56 exemption. And there are a number of other exemptions as well. Um, but this one is, uh, is I think, most relevant to our purposes. And lots of uh, co-conspirators, allies in the field have been um, making, I'm going to call it a loophole, making use of this uh, this loophole that is, exists in the uh, in the legislation. So, um, so and, and the cool thing about Section 56 exemptions is that um, it, it can potentially apply to a population. Um, they have historically, in recent history, been more successful um, when you apply for an individual, but they can uh, be applied to a population. So, uh, for example, like um, recent wins, um, we might have heard of um, in August 2020, the, uh, you know, Theracell, our friends there, um, amazing BC uh, nonprofit um, uh, fighting for access uh, to psilocybin assisted therapy for people who are um, faced with terminal illnesses and, and are in a palliative stage of care. They received four medical exemptions for end of life uh, psychotherapy assisted with psilocybin, um, which was un not unprecedented, precedented, but but that was the first legal use of psilocybin in Canada since 1974, which is like pretty huge. Um, um, and and, and the, the, the requests request were uh, originally they applied for the exemption request as a group, um, and uh, that wasn't successful. So then they went through and actually made separate applications uh, for the exemptions uh, for the individual for patients, and then they were um, approved. So the health minister um, and um, uh, uh, at the time, uh, thought it was in the in the public interest and the best interest of these individuals to provide an exemption from the legislation that says no, you can't do that. That's illegal to these people, so that they could receive um, uh, the psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. So that was so sort that of like the first like instance in recent, recent uh, history. history. But there's a, but there's been a number since then. It's been a bit of a, a landfall uh, since then. It, it it set a precedent. There has been a change in the health minister since then. So there has been a bit of a, a change in the way that um, acceptances have uh, come through, um, which is interesting. And, and we can talk about that. But that was sort of the first one. And there's been um, to date, I found an article that said January 2022, uh, that uh, 47 individuals had been granted Section 56 exemptions for end of for life end of psychological, life, psychological distress, distress. Um, um, and, uh, and uh, 19, 19 had been given to healthcare practitioners for training purposes. So that's of Jan as of January 2022. Um, um, but yeah, so, yeah. So the in the interesting thing though is that um, the city of Vancouver went ahead and applied for one of these exemptions for decriminalization in in the city limits, right? And then and then British Columbia as a province followed. And um, I, I think uh, Toronto is Toronto is working on that as well. And, yeah, uh, yeah. In front, you know, so like there's there's these applications out there now um, that basically are sort of pushing the limits of this exemption and saying we want you to exempt the entire city or province or you know the the area uh, for drug possession. So they're you know it's I think it's going to happen, right? Like that's, I, I, it looks like it's going to happen um, with, with, you know, disappointing thresholds uh, for people. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, like and it's so are, interesting that like you use the words like pushing the limits almost that it's like, okay, so first it was, you know, the individuals that got the second 56 exemptions for the palliative, um, uh, palliative related uh, distress. And then October later, 2020, that it was the, um, non-palliative, but still cancer diagnosis, um, folks with cancer diagnoses uh, who were treated for existential distress, but non-palliative. And then, you know, a group of, uh, and then a group of, of, of palliative patients received um, Section 56 exemptions um, in early uh, 2021. Um, and uh, there were also practitioners as a group who were given Section 56 exemptions. So we see almost the limits of, of what Section 56 um, applies to uh, expanding. And, uh, and now we see the, the exemption request for, you know, cities like Vancouver, um, Toronto is, come on, Toronto, like, we can't let Vancouver show us up all the time. Like, come on, guys, like, hurry up. Um, they're working on it. They're working on it. 
Um, but then, you know, we had BC, the entire province. So I, I think what this really shows is that, um, is that uh, the loophole, the Section 56 exemption is not enough. Um, it's not uh, robust enough to support the number of people who, who would benefit um, you know, the, the level of, of public, uh, the, the level of public interest that is represented by these, by these exemptions, um, they're, they're not robust enough to capture the interest in it right now. Um, yeah. so and it's, also, it's also the case that, um, I mean, you know, uh, criminal law is federally federal in Canada, right? So we, 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 we're not like the States where we have different laws for each, each particular state we have. It's, it's federal. So there's, you know, what, what does it mean when we say, um, you know, oh, drug, drug, possessing drugs is okay in Vancouver, but not in Saskatchewan, you know, or something like there's, there's sort of these disparities around like how, how we, you know, which activities are known and so, so it would known and expected and, and what you're, what you're, um, you know, what you're putting yourself at risk for doing. So I'm wondering if you could dig into um, just uh, talk a bit about the, maybe the two bills that are sort of before committees uh, right now, or they're moving. Sure. Through, yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we talked a little bit about like circumventing. So section 56 SAP is another one. Um, the, like it's a bit of circumventing, but then, but then we can talk about actually changing legislation and that's what these yeah, bills are, good. are proposing to do. So did you want to add something Scott? No, I just let, let's talk about those. So there's two two bills yeah. now before um, uh, Parliament, uh, and there's there's a couple others that are sort of proposed, but not haven't really moved. Yeah, forward. yeah. So there's um so C five is a um is basically a rehash of Bill C twenty two. Um so and that was Bill C twenty two was proposed um last uh, year, I believe, by the Liberal Party. Um, and it basically, uh, the, the goal is to um, amend the Criminal Code of Canada and the Controlled uh, Drugs and Substances Act. Um, and that, it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's proposed by, um, you know, um, the Honorable David Lametti and the Liberal Party. So it's, 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 it's not in, um, like, it's, it's a par Liberal Party sponsored bill. And since we have, you know, a Liberal federal government right now, and as you mentioned, the legislation um, pertaining, like the CDSA is a federal statute. Um, these bills tend to have a bit more traction than the ones that are uh, proposed by um, like independent uh, senators or independent uh, uh, party members. So um, so the, the goal of Bill C-5 is, and, and the, the changes that it uh, it's proposing is to eliminate mandatory minimum penalties for drug offenses. So um, as it stands right now, um, Anybody who has uh, uh, any any sort of drug offense, whether it's for personal possession, whether it's for um, trafficking, whether it's for um, you know manufacturing, there are mandatory minimum uh, uh, penalties imposed. Where um, it doesn't really uh, matter the the context or you know some of the social context uh, that Akwasi was talking about, that's not really taken into account. These these sanctions are right off the bat um, immediately um uh like people people immediately are are uh sanctioned um and they receive these mandatory minimum penalties so the proposal for bill c5 is to um is to actually eliminate those um and it, it goes that's sort of like very high level but it's also basically urging um prosecutors to take into account um some of those contextual factors um, including, you know, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, demographics, um, race, uh, and, um, and, you know, uh, other factors that, that lead, that might lead somebody to interacting with drugs and substances. Um, so that's, that's Bill C-5. They're also, um, urging, uh, police and prosecutors to consider alternatives to, uh, uh, personal possession charges. So rather than, uh, charges for um, personal possession, there might be, um, you know, uh, might, may, maybe nothing is is done for personal possession. Maybe it's it's deemed that it's it's fine, and and this person has you know no intent to traffic or anything like that, and and it's and it's fine. Maybe if they have a history of of you know 
uh, problematic substance use. Um, maybe they are deferred to, um, uh, you know, mental health court, um, and they might receive support rather than sanctions. Um, so that's okay. Bill C five, um, yeah, and just in a nutshell, very yeah. high level. Yeah. Yeah, hang on one second. So uh, across the, I'm wondering, you know, this this particular bill, it it's sort of, I, I think it's following along what the chiefs of police uh, recommended a while ago, uh, which which isn't exactly like eliminating possession, but it's it's allowing, um, it, it's putting more in the hands of prosecutors' discretion. D does that work? Like, do we do we is that is that a system that's workable, uh, in your opinion? <laughs> You know, the uh, Public Prosecution Office was directed, the Public Prosecution Service of Canada was directed a while ago, two summers ago now, was it, I think? Time's completely gone with COVID to stop following through with charges. And we have seen the reduction since then. So I don't want to say that nothing would happen. Like I have some serious concerns with it, basically the legislation mandates the police to use their discretion. They do that anyway right so for me it's like yeah sure some people are probably going to be given a break who's going to be given a break and a key part of this is um you know the diversion what are they being diverted to right and given the context that we're talking about here you know my concern is it's okay many people are going to be diverted to treatment not everyone needs treatment that uses drugs we know that we've talked about that already um but there's the inequities right across the country if you think about people in remote areas right what is what access to treatment may they have or, or like you know won't they have um and and would that be culturally appropriate or appropriate even if they did want it so there are there, there are huge problems with uh the bill as it's proposed sorry shall i, I I'll, I'll keep this brief like my deal is why not just repeal the section of the code as opposed to this kind of half measure but you probably want to go there, so I'll be quiet. We have, and we have, we have some legislation that's going to propose you to do that, right? Of course. <laughs> so what's the, what, Shell, what's the, which is the one that... Um, that is proposing the, just like do away with section four of the CDSA. That would be yeah. bill C216. Um, so it's it's interesting. Um, this chart that our lovely Taylor put together shows how like if we were to just like jigsaw puzzle piece these pieces of legislation together, what an amazing bill this would be because all together they they address you know repealing section four of the CDSA, um, which uh, basically is away with the idea of um, of of personal possession charges whatsoever um and uh does away with mandatory minimum penalties but bill c5 doesn't do that they're they're amending section four but they're not doing away with it completely as as akwasi was mentioning so um so bill c216 um is um an act to another act to amend the cdsa uh, but also includes this uh repealing of uh section four of the cdsa um uh and uh also has a, a sec it's the only bill to address uh expungement of of criminal records because as um Akwasi was uh, alluding to you know like there's there's people um there's people who are still in in jail for for cannabis uh uh crimes and and things and things like that so that's the only bill to address expungement of of criminal records and um it's one of the only two bills on the table that um is is urging the government of Canada to create a national strategy to address the the use of controlled drugs um including uh psychedelics which uh, of course we're interested in yeah Aquasia, do you, I, I know you're working with the cannabis Am amnesty project um organization do you do you want to talk a little bit about that like why that's like how that wasn't addressed in legalization and how we need to do better with that absolutely so cannabis amnesty was formed in the lead up to legalization we're a not-for-profit that has been lobbying the government for more equitable drug laws, period. But, you know, we specifically came together to try and pressure the government to clear the criminal records of people who had records for things that were no longer going to be illegal post legalization. Right. And the government at first said no. It was Bill Blair was the then cannabis czar and he wasn't going to touch it. And finally, there was enough pressure. And, and they you know, here's another half measure. They introduced this record suspension system um, that made going through the process like free to apply but still extremely arduous it's a multi-step process that still has a bunch of costs associated with it so uh, some cam h research from several years ago figured there were about five hundred thousand canadians with simple cannabis possession records the government itself figured there were ten thousand people eligible for the program the last statistic i got um 
it's from the pro board said that there were other it was either 450 or so or 500 people anyway like it's a small fraction of those that even the government thought were eligible which is a fraction of what uh, of the number of people who probably have canvas related records um have actually gone through that process so my hopes is as we move towards decrem like you know uh part of the issue with our records management systems is that the government that the justice system uh, representative said that they couldn't actually often distinguish between the type of substance and people might have been trafficking and had it reduced. And it was like, you know, a bunch of kind of government double speak nonsense, really. But um, my hopes is that given that we were able to get something going with cannabis amnesty and cannabis legalization, that as we continue to move forward, this will be much broader. It just makes sense, right? Like in your opening statements, Scott, you talked about, you know, the ramifications of a, a criminal record. I, I wrote in the piece last week that by criminalizing people for doing something so common, we as a country are literally shooting ourselves in the foot, right? Like these are people who have trouble finishing school if they're going to school, finding jobs, finding housing, just participating in society generally. Like why, why, why do we do this, right? So um, I think that you know we need to continue to have these discussions and put pressure in this specific area. Um, but yeah, I, again, I, I do hold out some hope because at least the conversation has been started with cannabis. Yeah, and it, and it's it's definitely important to carry on. You know, when we when we decriminalize other other drugs as well, or, or legalize, um, you know, that, that's definitely something we sh we should be going. And, and I know a lot of, a lot of people uh, advocated for that with you know beforehand yourselves and others yeah. advocated for that with the task force around cannabis, and it was ignored. Yeah, and I want to I want to respond because Antonio's raised a really good question here in the chat. And and so uh, as I've noted, like the government allows for a record suspension. So basically, like that used to be called a pardon. So the record is like sealed and it's not supposed to be accessible, you know, through the usual criminal record checks. If you had a high level security check done by a government agency like CSIS, it, it's going to come up, but it's supposed to be sealed. Uh, expungement's different, right? Like expungement is literally erasing those records. And the government had, had, had recently expunged records related to homosexual or to gay sex, right? So in recognizing that criminalizing gay sex was wrong, the government has expunged the records of people who've been criminalized under the criminal code for, for those behaviors um, in recognition that their criminalization represented a historic wrong, right? Like that's kind of the key language that they use. And the argument is that drug criminalization, right? Like, you know, harming not only individuals but but families and communities through criminalization does not represent a historic wrong right and, and we you know completely disagree especially when we look at the race-based targeting that we saw under you know with the cannabis data and we now see with the data more generally our drug laws came about for racist reasons they were enforced in a racist manner and that's had you know huge ramifications and it's not this is not just about race but you know given the given the it, it we got here because of a series of historic wrongs and those should be recognized so antonio i'm completely with you like expungement's the way to go and when we look south of the border right like they're letting artificial intelligence loose in numerous american jurisdictions on the record so that individuals don't have to do it themselves so the government can't say oh it's too expensive code for america has developed like ai tools that can literally like do i don't want to i'm just like kind of shooting in the dark with figures here but like you know 90 95 percent of the work um, yeah. and, and very little has to be done by a person that you know costs money. So that's that's where we should be going. Yeah. So you raised you raised our uh, neighbors south of the border. So I'd like to bring in our um, our uh, final guest, uh, Dan Abramson. Hey, Dan. Uh, let me let me read uh, Dan's bio here. So uh, Daniel Abramson, he's an American attorney, he works at the intersection of public health, criminal law, and human rights. In 1996, he founded the Office of Legal Affairs of the Drug Policy Alliance, a leading organization devoted to drug policy reform in the U.S. And he served as DPA's Director of Legal Affairs for two decades. Um, Dan's also served as an adjunct professor of law at the University of Virginia, University of California, Berkeley, and Hastings College of Law. He's helped craft, pass, and implement laws and regulations designed to end uh, marijuana prohibition, decriminalize various drugs, reduce mass criminalization, incarceration, promote harm reduction interventions in medication-assisted treatments, and expand access to therapeutic psychedelics, including working to establish the first regulatory scheme to provide widespread access to psilocybin therapy, which we're going to talk about a little bit, which is Oregon's Measure 109. Welcome, Dan. 
Thank you and greetings from Portland, Oregon, and uh, really appreciate being here this evening with you all. Um, I don't know if Scott, if you want to start off by asking me some questions or how we should. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Uh, you know, I'm guessing living in Oregon. So there were actually two ballot measures passed in uh, 2020, which were one. One was uh, 109, which was around psilocybin access. The other one was uh, 110, right? around decriminalization of drugs. I'm wondering if you're familiar at all with just sort of how that's rolling out and what what that's intended just by living there. I know you're you're focusing on the the therapeutic one, but I'm wondering if you can just give folks a bit of update about uh, about that. Sure. Well, you're exactly right. In November 2020, Oregon voters passed two uh, statewide voter initiatives, Measure 109 and Measure 110. Measure 110 was entitled the Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act. And what it did was it was the first state in the entire country to statewide decriminalize personal possession uh, of drugs uh, for personal use amounts. Uh, and so that was a sweeping uh, sweeping law. The first, uh, as I said, of, the, of its kind in the United States done statewide. We have a rich history of decriminalization across the country in many forms, but it's always typically at a local level, not a state level, except in the, in the circumstances of marijuana legalization, which has been uh, adopted by about 33 states at this point. But Oregon said across the board, regardless of the substance, we're going to decriminalize personal use of possession. And for larger amounts of possession, uh, they uh, defelonized in a way where they drastically reduced the criminal penalties attached to even larger uh, possession. And so, Scott, you asked me, how's it going? If this thing was passed in November 2020, it goes into effect January 2021. We're now in uh, April 2022. How's it going? And the answer is no one really knows. Uh, we don't really know because there hasn't been any data published by the state about its impact in terms of reduced arrests, which we uh, anticipated and researchers said would fall by roughly 95% across the state in terms of drug arrests. We don't have the data yet, but let me talk to you about the two portions. I, I described the decriminalization portion uh, of the statute, but there's a second portion, which was uh, the Recovery Act, the Treatment and Recovery Act part of that title, which was uh, taking funds uh, from two sources in the states. One. In, in the state of Oregon. One, cost savings associated from not having to arrest and prosecute, jail and imprison people for drugs. So there's cost savings that accrue to the state for not having these penalties in place. And second, Oregon, uh, like several other states across the country, has legalized, taxed and regulated marijuana. And as a result, brings in several hundred million dollars a year from taxes. Uh, and the tax and regulate uh, scheme in Oregon has the marijuana monies going to various different uh, buckets, including uh, education, treatment, law enforcement, what have you. Measure 109 said, we are going to take some of that money off the top after set amounts are given to those buckets and, and divert the rest of those monies into treatment to be accessible for the people who uh, are caught with drugs, but are no longer criminalized for being caught with drugs. And so but also, they were... also um, it, it also went into harm reduction services, right? And so I think That's there right. were- yeah. well, I say of... treatment, I meant harm reduction as well. So it's a yeah. large bucket. We can go to a lot of different things. But in answer to your question, we have, Oregon has set aside roughly $270 million as of today to go to these services that include harm reduction services and straightforward treatment, as well as wraparound social services. It really is defined broadly what this money can go to to help people. There's very few limits on that. The issue is none of that money has gone out the door yet, or very little of it has gone out the door because the state has taken a very methodical approach and a very sort of community oriented approach to soliciting grant applications for organizations to whom this money should go, and then a two-tiered review process where every grant application is reviewed twice uh, before the money. And so right now we've got this backlog of about 333 applications for grants, uh, very few of which have received their second level of review 
but many of which are about to receive their second level of review. So in the next six or eight weeks, we're expecting a lot of money in Oregon to go out the door and finally reach a year plus into this system. Uh, a lot of these organizations around the state that badly need these monies to provide treatment and prevent overdose and provide harm reduction services and what have you. So we don't have data. We just right. know the money is piling up and it's not being going out the door yet. So I'm hoping you do this uh, panel again in a year from now and I'll have something better to report, I hope. Okay. And I, and I do know, though, that, you know, so the, the way the way the Oregon scheme was set up is um, it wasn't, you know, if you were if you were caught with drugs, you weren't just left alone. You instead of um, a criminal penalty, you were issued a civil fine. So like a like a parking ticket, a citation. You right? could be issued, you'd be issued a citation. You could be issued a fine up to one hundred dollars. Right. Uh, okay. And you can choose to call a hotline uh, and sort of that's your way around a fine. You can seek out a treatment and call a hotline. My understanding is very few people are calling that hotline. Um, and are they, so- Are they, are they still system. paying their uh, 100 bucks or are they We just don't have the data on that either yet. No. That, you know, we, we should have money, we should have data on how many people are paying their fines, how many fines are outstanding, how much money is being collected. We don't have that yet. Okay. Um, so all of that data will be forthcoming, I suspect. Um, but we also aren't hearing of people being arrested for these. Right. Uh, non-crimes anymore, uh, which is dramatic. You know, Oregon had several thousand people a year, over 2,000 people a year being arrested for these uh, offenses. And as Akwazi was saying, it's typically poor people. Typically people of color are disproportionately affected by how the policing occurs uh, across the United States, but especially in Oregon. And so much of the voters' uh, decision to pass this was around racial justice-oriented reasoning. Uh, this these laws disproportionately affect communities of color. Yeah. So I know I know a decision was made in Oregon to not, you know, and, and, and people always sort of advocate they're like, you know, oh, you're you're caught with drugs. We need to mandate you into some program or treatment. And and I know the decision was made in Oregon to not do that, uh, to make it to make it voluntary. And, and I'm watching, I was just watching conversations on Twitter now where people are you know, in Canada, raising again, like you know, we ought to we ought to just mandate, uh, you know, mandate people going to treatment. What's what's mm -hmm. wrong with? Uh, I'm going to be like devil's advocate here. What's wrong with um, advocating, or, or what's wrong with making people uh, go into treatment? Why why can't we just mandate that they go into drug treatment? So many things are wrong with mandating people <laughs> to go into drug treatment, uh, least of which. Uh, we do have data about people being mandated in treatment versus good treatment just being offered to be accessible on a voluntary basis. Uh, and the, that data shows uh, that mandated treatment is no more successful than just providing quality treatment to be accessible to people voluntarily. Second, you've got a whole host. Uh, as a civil rights attorney, I have to speak out and say, mandating somebody into a program, coercing them, into a program uh, for, for uh, drug use uh, really uh, violates, I believe, uh, basic civil liberties and freedom of will, especially if you're in a decriminalized context, uh, that uh, mandated treatment, uh, A, as we said, is not as effective, and B, if you're mandating somebody into treatment and they don't do well in treatment, then the question is what happens to them next? Mm -hmm. And almost always the response is a punitive one. If we've mandated you into treatment and you don't do well by our standards of what doing well means, and it almost always excludes harm reduction measures for doing well, like using less drugs is doing well in a harm reduction measure, using less <laughs> drug, less, less in a less harmful way, by many measures in the mandated system is failure. And so failure tends to be met with punitive sanctions, which then gets you deeper and deeper into a penal, you know, punitive criminal justice frame of mind when this whole effort is to try to extract drugs and drug use and drug users from a criminal system and make it a public health harm reduction oriented system. So yeah. in a nutshell, those are the two big reasons. Thank you. So Akwasi, we, we, have, we have drug courts in Canada but I which sort of operate it's not it, it's it's you know it's it's quasi quasi consensual you agree to enter this uh, program like how how do those work do you have do you have those in Toronto do they do they work 
We, we do have them in Toronto. I've got to admit that I'm not an expert on drug treatment courts kind of generally. Um, I think they've had in some ways some successes, you know, for some, but I think again, like some people feel coerced to go through those. And I think the biggest thing going back to um, what Daniel's just mentioned is, you know, what happens when you fail and what happens when that failure is on like your, your record essentially, right? Like, does that limit your opportunities for treatment? Say you, you know, were busted later on with some drugs and you're actually ready for treatment. Like, is that going to limit your opportunities to take that? Or, or if you're uh, arrested, you know, again, is that going to influence what, the police or a prosecutor is going to do with you. So now I think we need some novel approaches to dealing with and, and, and addressing people who, you know, um, are caught with substances and perhaps commit other crimes. And I think that's, you know, where drug treatment courts can be of some benefit rather than just saddling people with fines rather than throwing them in jail, right? Like having another option and a less punitive option than, than either of those. But yeah, I, I'm sure that everyone on, on that I can see on the screen and many people listening will recognize that if someone's not ready for treatment, forcing them to get treatment is is probably going to do very little, right? Like, or, you know, it's going to be less effective anyway. So. And my my understanding is like you know you you you're you you plead you have to plead guilty to get into a drug court, and you know maybe maybe you'd be subject to you know whatever a year a year eighteen months uh, in prison. So you you now you don't have that. You go through a program. Uh, that's maybe uh, a year, uh, month eleven. Uh, you have a positive urine screen, so you don't you don't get credit for the eleven months you've now spent. You're back to your original punishment uh, that would, you would have had. So you're basically serving extra. And that admission of guilt is huge. And the, the same goes even for diversion programs, right? Like you enter into a diversion program, that's an Im implicit admission of guilt, which can harm you down the road. So I think that's a big, and, and that was an oversight on my part. That's a huge piece of this, right? Is is that? Yeah that typical admission of guilt. Yeah. yeah. Shall, uh, do you know, are, are any of the, are any of the bills talking about things like uh, drug courts or uh, sort of mandatory treatment types of things that you're familiar with? Yeah, they, a few of them talk about, um, uh, there's like bill C5 that talks about requiring police and prosecutors to consider alternatives to personal possession charges. So that might be court diversion. Uh, it might, also be uh, nothing sometimes sometimes uh, you know I guess the question is who gets to deem what problematic substance use is um, uh, perhaps there there needs to be a, a higher threshold for understanding of what what denotes something as problematic substance use like perhaps if somebody is involved with um, like violent crime or something like that in addition to in addition to substance use that might be a better threshold than um, you know, intent to traffic or something like that, because uh, a lot of the times people get involved in criminal activity, either A, because they, um, you know, they've been in the criminal system before, and um, as others have alluded to before, it's, you know, these are people who, it, it's going to be harder to find work, it's going to be harder to get a good credit card credit check to get, you know, housing, it's going to be harder to complete school. So um, some people are also engaging in, in criminal um, activity in order to uh, support uh, support getting more substances too. So some people might engage in, in drug trafficking to uh, to obtain more substances or engage in sex work to, uh, to get more substances. So that also speaks to the issue of like safe supply as well being important. Um, if you're going to expect people to uh to you know not or encourage people to engage in less dangerous risky activity um but you're also uh you know you're not you're not going to provide them an alternative or um or, or you're, you're not going to provide them safe supply how are people ex expected to to uh succeed in harm reduction programs or, or things like that so there are a couple of the bills that are talking about um you know the language is very um you know, requiring them to consider alternatives. And as Akwasi mentioned, that's already happening um, and it's, it's, it's not happening, right? So that's why, um, you know, uh, the drug uh, policy and advocacy team, we've actually made some recommendations to, um, <clears throat> to the various uh, sponsors of the bills to, to think about amending some of the bills to remove some of that language that allows discretionary um sanctions uh from prosecutors from uh judges from from police etc uh because as we know like you know a history of having discretionary uh ha having that that discretion doesn't 
doesn't lead to better outcomes necessarily. So we're talking about like eliminating uh, sanctions for personal possession and uh, uh, having prosecutors uh, take into account things like context, uh, like racial background, socioeconomic status uh, before uh, mandating something like like drug court or mandating treatment or even um, issuing any sort of sanctions whatsoever. So in a nutshell, yeah, some of the bills do talk about it, but in uh, in language that can still be, I guess, exploited to not actually do what they're purporting to do. And uh, yeah, we're making some recommendations around uh, how to do away with some of that more ambiguous language uh, so that these uh, mistakes don't keep happening, basically. And if I can just add here, and I just Googled it, this is one of the perils of doing online is you can like look for things as people are talking. But I, I recall correctly, um, the Prime Minister's mandate letter to the Minister of Justice, in the mandate letter, it's it, the Prime Minister has asked the Minister of Justice to continue to work drug treatment court, the default option for first time nonviolent offenders, right? So that I think in and of itself speaks to a, 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 a an expansion of and kind of entrenching of, of drug treatment courts, you know, whether or not we, we see them as positive, they're, they're clearly a feature that uh, our current government thinks are, are, are a good thing. Yeah, they, they, they seem to sell well with the public uh, who, you know, like, like people want to feel good about not incarcerating people, but uh, you know, they're, they're sort of uneasy with the idea of nothing should happen. And so it's, it's this, uh, you know, and I feel like that's a, that's a slippery slope slippery slope when you start talking about, uh, you know, civil rights, like you were talking about, Dan, and, and, and also just, you know, the fact that like people are not, uh, you know, the vast majority of people who consume drugs are, do not have a problematic relationship to them. So there's, there's actually nothing we're treating, um, but you're sort of forced to go through this, this process here. And so it's, uh, I want to also just mention the dark underside of the drug courts, which is a huge, movement in the United States. Drug courts have a lot of power. There's several thousand of them around the country, uh, mm -hmm. and they're really fighting to keep their turf. Uh, and so they, drug courts have been really some of the leading opponents of drug liberalization laws, including marijuana laws. And when you scratch the surface and you ask, why are the drug court judges speaking out against these changes? The answer comes down to they lose clients. If the laws change, they get fewer people coming into the courtroom and they have less leverage and they're losing their budgets and they don't want to lose their budgets. And so they are an interest group that wants to keep their business. And so drug courts have been some of the leading voices against changing punitive drug laws simply to keep their turf. And what's interesting about laws like we've seen in Oregon, the first one out of the gate, decrim across the board, regardless of substance, is it's a de facto end around drug courts. Drug courts in Oregon are going to have to reconstitute themselves if they're going to continue providing services. And how are they going to do it? They're going to do it to the. They're going to bring into their courtrooms exactly the people Aquazi is speaking about: people who've committed real crimes, who happen to also have drug problems, who would benefit from being in a courtroom context where treatment becomes available to them, as opposed to simple drug offenders. Uh, and those are harder cases to take. And judges want an easier life for themselves. Uh, but they're going to, if they want to keep drug court doors open, they're going to have to take these types of cases that should have been their bread and butter to begin with, but weren't. The, the, these are problem solving courts, right? And many times they're not actually solving problems. As you said, they're just easier for the people working in them. We want them to solve problems if that's what they're going to be. It, left to their own devices, they'd be net widening courts. Yeah. They'd be sweeping in more people that are easier for them to claim success on because they didn't have problems to begin with. They increase their budgets. In terms uh, of I don't know if we're going to get there yet, Scott, but like you just you just said something that always like, you know, gets to me is is like people are uneasy with doing nothing. And it's like, how do we deal with that? Right. Like, how do we get people comfortable with doing nothing? Like, I think that's. And, 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 and Daniel, you know, like you're, you're in a jurisdiction where people are more comfortable, clearly. It's not nothing. You can, you know, pay a fine or, or call a hotline. It's not nothing, but you're much closer to nothing than we are. How do we get there? Well, it's partly, you know, what, what we learned in the United States through running these initiatives for 20 some years is that the people are ahead of the politicians. And if you can ask the people directly without going through the legislative process and working through elected officials, if you can go directly to the people and say, 
What do you want to do? What makes sense to you? Changing the laws in a dramatic way or doing this piecemeal stuff? The people get it right more times than not, uh, especially on issues of drugs. They get it. They're all affected personally with drug issues, and they get that penalization has not worked for them. It has not made their lives better. It has not made them safer. It's not made their family lives better. Uh, and so that's how these initiatives pass, is the people are ahead of the politicians on this. But in jurisdictions where you don't have the initiative process, which is the majority of the states in the United States, you're stuck uh, going through the traditional legislative process, which is much slower. Yeah. And we, and we uh, in, in some jurisdictions, we have initiatives, but the threshold to get anything on is so ridiculously high, it's, it's meaningless in many ways it's just very very i'd like to i'd like to add to that um in addition to you know the people being ahead of the the politics um i think it's important to uh i'm, I'm trying to think of like hmm, education obviously and public education initiatives where are we going to get the most bang for our buck in terms of public education initiatives and i'm thinking um health law and law enforcement like these are these are areas where um, the the data, uh, some of the data that you're talking about, Dan, or or you know that you know a Google search <laughs> during a webinar will bring up uh, from Vice. Um, this data needs to be part of curriculums for healthcare providers, for people who want to go into law, for people who want to go into law enforcement, um, and uh, because this is a cultural consciousness issue. This is this is this idea. You know, it's it's one of the really most insidious legacies of the war on drugs. It's this idea of like the drug user as this like shady, dangerous person who needs to be dealt with, right? Um, and and part of that, I, I think we need to be continue to be more open and like come out about the fact that like, um, no, that's not that's not the case. Um, uh, to well, you know to change public perception around that, but also educate educate um, people who are going to want to uh, bring new material and new perspectives into their professions. So, yeah, so, you know, uh, Dr. Carl Hart uh, is, you know, notable, notable for advocating that those of us who are in positions of privilege who can disclose our own drug use, we do so because, you know, largely the stories you read are, you know, folks in marginalized communities or the downtown east side, like that's the portrayal of who a drug user is. And the reality is like drug use is common among all economic uh, levels and stratas and different communities. And so uh, the idea was that, you know, those of us who can safely come out and say like, I I use drugs and I'm, I'm saying that personally, yes, I, I use uh, drugs. Um, some of them are not legal. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I, I can say that with, uh, you know, knowing that the police aren't going to be busting down my door and doing it, but us, you know, normalizing that a little bit, uh, would help. But I, I'll note though, that, um, I, I think it was a, a couple years ago, there was a Ipsos, uh, poll in Canada, you know, that, um, over, over half of Canadians are in favor of decriminalization. Like, I, I think when you start looking at, uh, places like British Columbia, it's 60% uh, upwards uh, of the population. And so, um, you know, I, I, re I really do think it's a bit of cowardice uh, on behalf of the government um, and particularly the federal government to sort of kick it down to, you know, city of Vancouver to make changes or the province. Like, it's just not, you know, as, as a lawyer, it's just not sensible, like how, how we should be governing in a country that has federal criminal law, we should be thinking about this from a federal perspective. And uh, the the, re the reality, though, is that you know a lot of a lot of people are you know fearful of their their cars getting broken into and public safety and these other narratives. And and nobody nobody is really voting as drug policy is their top issue, right? It's just not. It, it's it's a, a thing people when asked specifically about it. They may care about it, but when it comes down to voting in the polls, it's it's something that's used as a, a battering ram against progressive politicians, unfortunately. Um, you know, you're soft on crime or soft on drugs. And I think part of it, too, goes to the fact that a lot of people have a rather unsophisticated understanding of what the criminalization of drugs actually does for, like, broader criminal enterprise, right? Like, people watch shows like Narcos. They watch whatever it might be and and they think that that's cool and sexy but they also like i don't think enough 
consider that the drugs that they may be consuming or that the drugs that other people around them are consuming are exactly what is fueling that, right? Like they, they separate themselves from the whole criminal enterprise that goes along with drugs being illegal. So yeah, like it's completely politically untenable, I would say, for most federal politicians to want to be progressive with respect to drug policy. And we have just a handful of people that, that do that here in this country, right? I think, you know, to your point, Shell, about the education, like the, not only education around kind of like the harms of, of criminalization for the individual user, but for society more generally, right? Like what does the criminalization of drugs do for the safety of our streets, right? Like the flow of, uh, you know, guns into our country, um, uh, the, the house prices in Vancouver for crying out loud, right? Like all of these, there are all of these kind of like knock on effects. Uh, we call it snow washing, right? Like the, the, the laundering of, of illegal assets through through can Canadian like real estate and other markets. Like there are all these knock on effects to criminalize. And I'm, you know, I'm, I consider myself um, like quite liberal with respect to like my view of, of what should be and should not be criminal. Uh, but I recognize again um, that, that, you know, criminal activity does have a, a host of negative outcomes and the extent to which we can reduce those and their impact on, you know, the people that, that I come across in my work, because they're often, you know, the foot soldiers on the street, but the people that are actually getting shot, right? They're actually ending up in jail who are, who are on the front lines of, you know, in this context, the war on drugs. Yeah, thank you. So I want, I want to... I want to take advantage of the fact that we have Dan Dan on here and uh, your expertise. And so the other, so the the initiative that Dan is uh, focused on, I think, is going to be really interesting to you folks as we're a psychedelics organization. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, Measure 109 in Oregon, which which is another another groundbreaking uh, step step in drug reform. So Measure what's, 109, what's yeah, sure. It's, it's entitled the Psilocybin Services Act. Uh, also passed in uh, November of 2020. And what it does is it says psilocybin, the state of Oregon uh, is now in charge of regulating psilocybin access for anyone ages 21 or over. I'll repeat that again. Oregon <laughs> is now in the game of making sure that people over the ages of 20, 21 and over can access regulated psilocybin. I did not use the word medical. Uh, if this is not a medical program. This is not like medical cannabis where you need a diagnosis and you got to go see a doctor first. Um, but it is regulated in the following sense. The Oregon is in the process of uh, creating state approved training programs where facilitators who will be essentially sitters or guides for people's psilocybin experiences will be trained uh, through these training programs and psilocybin will be administered at state licensed service centers which will be essentially businesses around the state authorized by the state to administer psilocybin under the guidance of these licensed and trained facilitators to anyone 21 years and over who would like access to it and who passes a screening exam indicating that it would not be adverse to their health to use psilocybin uh, in this fashion. Uh, so don't need to go to a doctor for permission. Uh, you do need to you know, pass your screening exam to show that you will not be harmed by the taking of psilocybin. Uh, and all of that has been in the process of being created. Uh, and according to the law, the law cannot start, these, these entities, these service centers cannot be licensed, these facilitators cannot uh, be licensed until January of 2023 at the earliest. So what Oregon did is they gave itself, Oregon gave itself two years to ramp up this program to create and license these facilitators and these service centers. And we are now in April of 2022, uh, and what we have is a series of regulations and rules that will govern the program uh, that have been drafted by the state with public input and are now seeking public input through the month of April. Uh, and then will be finalized uh, beginning in May uh, with more regulations to come online as the year goes on. But everybody's slowly ramping up to, to begin this and create this program from scratch, the first of its kind anywhere in the world. 
much less anywhere in the United States. So I'll just pause there and say we have no data because there's nothing running yet, but it's all in the process of being made as we speak. It's amazing. So are, are you anticipating, the question on everyone's mind is, are you anticipating uh, psilocybin tourism? Absolutely, or industry you anticipating it. Is, is uh, this some people are certainly rubbing their hands in anticipation of people coming from all over the country. Um, the Oregon law, both for political reasons, financial reasons, and constitutional reasons, cannot limit their program only to Oreg Oregonians. So anybody can come to Oregon and take advantage of this program. Uh, the question is, what is going to be the capacity, especially in the years one and two, the earlier years of the program, uh, to actually accommodate the demand? And we don't know to what extent supply will be ready to accommodate demand. Uh, so that's a big question mark. Yeah, that's fabulous. Thank you. Uh, I'd love to love to have you back on again uh, in the future after this is rolled out to get some some data when you have it. Um, about that, uh, we we do have a few questions that were posed about uh, decrim. Um, so uh, the first one, I'll, I'll just pose it to anybody who wants to jump in. Um, are are police officers the most adequate people to enforce drug laws? What would be a good alternative? And so I think this is I think there's a little sentiment around um, some of the defund the police movement. Uh, this idea that you know police are police are sort of trained with a certain mindset and maybe maybe they're not the best people to have first contact with with folks who are uh, using potentially problematically i'm wondering i wonder what you what y'all think about that i can lead like in a nutshell no like they're they're given the nature of the work that they do they're often on the streets and they have become the default first responder but like absolutely not and i don't think many people go into policing wanting to do that job either right so it's like a lose 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 situation the user loses the officer loses and we as a society lose and we need to you know come up with ways to do better and you know i think there are a number of american jurisdictions especially that are, are doing a lot better in this respect uh than, than we are but uh no, certainly not, you know, around kind of general possession and use. You know, I go back again to like, how do we deal with sophisticated criminal networks who are, you know, poisoning people? We need an adequate response to that, right? Part of that, again, is, is, is of course, going to be law enforcement, but uh, not for the average uh, uh, drug user, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the response might look different too, depending on what is actually happening. Like, like, okay, person using drugs, you know, that, that can look like literally anything, right? Or, or person involved in drug trafficking, that could look like, that could look like anything. So um, the type of response needs to be tailored to, um, you know, is the person a harm to themselves? Are they a harm to, um, you know, others? Uh, or are they just making, you know, like, <laughs> you're on your way to get your coffee and it's uncomfortable to look at. That is not, that is not an emergency, you know? So um, different levels or different types of configurations of response teams might be needed. We actually did, um, we were able to participate in a focus group with uh, Toronto Public Health uh, when they uh, were considering putting forth the Section 56 uh, decriminalization exemption request. Um, and uh, they asked a really, really good question, which is like, okay, if not police, like, you know, go, like, like who? Uh, so, so we had to think on it and, and it would probably involve, um, you know, mental health professionals, anybody who's worked in, um, in an inpatient uh, mental health unit with people who are not doing well, uh, would probably, um, I think, have better skills uh, to work with somebody who's experiencing problematic uh, substance use in that it, it, they're in distress. Um, but, but that level of intervention is going to look different um, than somebody who's, you know, blocking the doorway of Tim Hortons <laughs> versus somebody who is uh, engaging in, in perhaps a more a more violent crime versus somebody who, um, you know, it, 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 the level of intervention and response is going to be different depending on what's actually happening. And you might have response teams that involve um, mental health professionals, social service workers. Perhaps you, you do need um, to employ people who are able to use physical force at, at, at some point um, if they're if the person is you know at risk of, of if they're you know standing in the middle of, of a busy highway or something like that and and they're gonna potentially injure themselves or somebody else you might need people who are able to use 
um, physical or chemical restraints. Like that's just, I, I think, a, a reality. But that's not going to be every single time or for every single um, person who uh, is more of a, an inconvenience or, or something not nice to look at as opposed to um, somebody who's actually in harm's way or causing other harm. So the, the response needs to be tailored, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, I think it's, I think it's sort of, you know, we, we, we have a question, you know, why, why is it offensive to look at somebody uh, smoking something out of, out of a, a crack pipe uh, as opposed to like somebody drinking coffee, also, both drugs or alcohol? I mean, you know, like, wait, why do we have to question a bit of like how our pro, how we're programmed a bit to find things objectionable or offensive around that. And I think that's, uh, that's definitely a challenge. Um, so here, here's a question. Um, uh, considering there are companies, I think this is um, maybe in a, a quasi question. Considering there are companies profiting from selling cannabis uh, and also others offering psychedelic therapy, what could these organizations do to provide reparations to those affected by the war on drugs, specifically marginalized communities? I was just thinking about this, you know, we were talking about like other place, the best response to drug users. And I think about, you know, like kind of small scale traffickers and the violence that often goes along with like arrests for dealing in small quantities of drugs. And these are still taking place even for cannabis now when like I can walk in any direction from my house, not too far and find like, you know, cannabis stores that look like, like um, Apple stores, right? Like, the, the, the sale of and the trade in, in narcotics does not need to look the way that it does. It does, again, I go back to that point because it's criminalized. So I, I'm not actually answering the question. I'm just trying to like expand the way we think about drugs and, and, and how we get our drugs. With respect to the um, kind of reparations piece, like I think that there's a multi-pronged approach needed to repair the harms of prohibition, right? So first and foremost, that needs to be on the government. Any new drug law, any reform to drug law needs to include measures to you know, not only provide opportunities for the individuals who were directly or indirectly harmed by the war on drugs to participate in these new regulated industries, but also divert some of the revenues from legal sales back into those communities that were most harmed. You know, I look at uh, Illinois, I look at um, New York as kind of good examples with respect to cannabis of, of how that can be done. Doesn't mean that they're going to work well out of the gate um, in practice, but at least we've got a model that we can like tweak and improve. With respect to the companies themselves, and I, again, I look at the cannabis industry and I see some of the players in the cannabis industry now, uh, and I'm not going to kind of name any names or even point to any demographics, but it's like, it's hugely offensive to me that people can carry on and they can, you know, um, try and uh, like heavily tr lobby for the police to crack down on the illegal sale of drugs while they've just entered into this industry, right? And they've got their shiny stores and like the people often like, you know, rip on the soccer moms who are like, you know, baking with and we got people that are sitting in jail uh, for doing the, you know, like not even the exact same thing, much, much, much smaller quantities. But I do think that these companies have, have part, and I'm, now I'm rambling, these companies have an ethical obligation to do the right thing here, right? So again, like that's like, um, uh, inclusivity in their hiring, right? Like that's uh, not just like corporate social responsibility, but like proper sustainability in terms of like the things that they're doing with their money and, and, and what they're, you know, uh, uh, the, the charitable kind of giving, it's not just charitable giving. But when we look at cannabis, like I think, you know, the long-term success of, of many cannabis companies is gonna hinge on things like this, right? We live in an, an era of increasing uh, conscious consumerism. And as, as uh, the cannabis industry, as we see in Canada becomes much more cutthroat, like look at the companies like I don't want to name names, but Canopy and like the work that they're doing. And they're doing that work, like their CSR work, their sustainability work to be relevant, right? Because they know that it matters at least to a sub subsegment of the population. And I and I I think it's it's also like particularly offensive to find uh, people who have been at the front lines of the war on drugs, you know, police or yeah. uh, prosecutors, others, you know, getting like as soon as the money turns, they're they're investing in cannabis companies or right. running them. It's just, it's sort of- Ju Julie and Fantino here, right? That, you know, yeah. like equated dealing drugs with murder and then was one of the first people, like, you know, in the first 50 or so that to, to own a licensed production facility or be a licensed producer here. Like that is, like that's obscenely offensive, obscenely, obscenely. And we're seeing the same south of the border, right? law enforcer, the he was a law enforcer and a politician in, in both portfolios. 
he was extremely hard. I'm going to ramble on about him too because, like, you know, the number of I I I, I uh, ran the numbers the uh, one day, like the number of people who were targeted in Toronto, like under his uh, tenure as chief of police, right? And you could get down like the number of people arrested in Kensington Market, where one of the subsidiaries of his company ended up opening a shop, like. The hypocrisy, the hypocrisy. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I think uh, we have time for one more question. And um, okay, it's, it's sort of a, to anyone, what can we do as individuals to push for decriminal, decriminalization of all drugs? What can we do? Like, I think, I think people are sort of, they they struggle, you know. We we write letters. Uh, we we have Maps Canada where we're going to be um, we're making submissions around these bills and you know advocating for uh, for elimination of uh, Section Four, uh, but also also um, uh, elimination of criminal offenses for small scale trafficking as well, because often often people are uh, selling for subsistence, uh, which really should be part of decriminalization. But what can what can individuals do? Like how can they how can they be involved in this process, legislative process, or or sort of turn the tide? No bad ideas in brainstorming. We we have this amazing uh, like at least in 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 Canada and and Dan maybe you can speak to more of the context in the states. But like I I was speaking um, to a friend of mine who lives in uh, in Puebla, Mexico, about um, how I was contacting my MP about um, CERB. Uh, the the pandemic uh, response uh, uh, for businesses uh, during during the lockdowns, and she looks at me over video chat, and she says, "You can speak to someone in your government," and and we just like it's we we forget like what a privilege it is. Like yes, are we often you know sending letters and emails out into the ether, hoping that they don't fall on deaf ears, or like you know speaking to a junior staffer um at an at an office somewhere who is like yep totally agree i'm gonna send it up the flagpole uh, but we have this amazing privilege to actually be able to participate um in government and and yes there is a lot to be said like okay do we try to function in in the system that um is ultimately based in systems of, of racism and oppression and, and things like that um this is the system that we have we have uh ways of um of of having these conversations uh with local government you you never know who is actually going to pick up the phone and answer when you're going to get a call back if that feels really daunting as an individual uh to take on you know that on top of everything else everyone has going on in their lives um you don't have to do it alone like there are tons of organizations substance user organizations um are, are a great uh way to to get involved as way uh, as well maps canada uh, other decrim organizations that are doing really really um, good work. Um, so you don't actually have to be the one knocking on doors and, and putting the boots on the pavement and, and making the calls. You can support organizations that are doing that kind of work and, and have your say in terms of uh, what kind of work should be done. Um, there's uh, compassion fatigue is real. Um, activist fatigue is real. So finding uh, organizations that are already doing this this kind of good work where you can um, you can throw your support behind, whether that's even just like uh you know participating in a survey re retweeting something to the health minister um you know uh, uh you know sharing stories about coming out about your own drug use if you have the, the privilege and safety social safety to do so uh th there's lots of ways uh to get involved and in, uh without necessarily calling up uh calling up your mps but that's great too I've spoken a lot towards the end of this uh, conversation, so I'd love to hear what uh, what Dan has to say. Well, I think we're sort of coming up on time, but Shell, I think you did an excellent job of really covering a lot of the bases of how people can be individually involved. Uh, and I really would second everything you just said. Uh, and in terms of, you know, I think you can have a powerful voice by every time somebody, local elected official, a regional elected official, a national elected official, anytime they want your vote, ask them, What's your stance on decrim and why don't you take this stance as opposed to another stance and let people know that it matters. If they want your vote, they need to start looking deep and hard at these policies. Uh, and even if it's a local body that has nothing to do with drug regulation, you should ask that question of anybody who wants your vote, where do you stand in this? 
uh, and that's how coalitions are built and that's how yeah. power gets uh, made over time. And I'm, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little self brag. Uh, I I wanted to raise awareness of drug policy issues in BC, and so I ran I ran as a Green Party candidate in the last uh, provincial election, uh, uh, in opposite of our um, Minister of Health, who you know in, in he was going to be elected and is not doing enough on drug issues, and so got to got to call him on on some of his, some of his uh, inactivity around uh, drug policy change. I, d I didn't win. I'm still here. But um, okay, so anyway, I, I'd like to, uh, I'm gonna wrap up here. I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's on here for joining us tonight, uh, for your generous support of MAPS Canada. Our special thanks, my special thanks to Akwasi Owusu Bempa, Shell Scott and Dan Abramson for participating and sharing their expertise and what, what I think was a really uh, great conversation. And I wanna let you know that our next webinar in our drug policy advocacy series is going to be Wednesday, May 18th, 5 to 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and that we will be exploring psychedelic harm reduction in that episode. So uh, tune in. That's uh, when we have some great information around the topic of psychedelic harm reduction and what we're doing around advocacy to increase the availability for drug testing uh, in Canada. Um, it's a final word. We are, again, a nonprofit charity. We rely on donations. Supporters continue to do our work. You can always make a donation to MAPS Canada through our website. You can also find a link there to our store for some clothing and other swag that supports us with each purchase. And you can even buy uh, drug testing kits now that we're offering uh, through our website uh, in partnership with uh, Dance Safe in the U.S. So uh, test your drugs, be safe, and uh, thank you very much and have a great night.